Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here. This is a very busy week in Washington, and it's terrific to see this group that's focusing on an issue that we have to think of as long-term institution building. Not necessarily hype today, but investments have to be made and remade in the next few years. Uh, I'm Nancy Birdsall, the president of the Center for Global Development, and this is a discussion we will have, I, I'm looking forward to it, on how donors and governments can help strengthen the quality of development and economic data in Africa. We've all been hearing in the last few years about questions about economic data, uh, and that's kind of motivates a lot of what my colleagues have been doing. The event marks the launch of the Data for African Development Working Group report, co-chaired by Amanda Glassman, a senior fellow at CGD, and Alex Eze from the African Population Health Research Center based in Nairobi. Many of you will know about Alex's work and about the terrific center that he runs there. I think we'll be hearing from him in a few moments on video. We teamed up at CGD with a APHRC because we're concerned with behavior of donors and the rich world and what they're doing and not doing. Uh, we feel we're s pretty strong on that. And uh, Alex and his uh, team in Nairobi are concerned with and know about country level challenges in Africa. So it's, I've, I've observed it as a great partnership. The report calls for donors and governments to look beyond big data and more data um, and address the systemic and political problems underlying bad data in the region. I've heard Amanda talking about this and she's had a deep impression on me. Let's get to some realism about do donor programs and priorities and requests for data dominate national statistical priorities. Questions about whether the, there's vulnerability of data in the low-income countries in Africa to political and interest group influence. Questions about whether poorly designed policies in the data area induce misreporting. These are tough issues and it's important that we've had this group addressing them frontally. We all know that the post-2015 development agenda is generating momentum for a worldwide data revolution and drawing a lot of attention to the need for better development data and economic data in general in Africa and elsewhere. Uh, realizing the potential of this renewed interest will require all involved to experiment with new approaches and to face some of the tough realities around current incentives and current priorities for where money goes. Not revert to business as usual, to change the way data is collected, used, and made public. Uh, so I look forward to hearing more about this as we go forward with the panel today. But before that, I have the great privilege, honor, and delight, actually, in introducing our keynote speaker, well known to all of you, Donald Kaparuka, who's the president of the African Development Bank and a longtime friend of CGD. And I asked him permission as we were walking in if I could say that we like to say that early on in President Kaparuka's uh, period as president, we feel we had a little bit of healthy influence on the way he was thinking about the major challenges that he would, did and would be facing at the African Development Bank. And I'm very proud of the fact that we might have had that kind of influence because when we at CGD can influence the big players who really make a difference in what's happening in the world, then we feel very accomplished ourselves. So President Kabaruka, over to you. Good afternoon. Nancy, thank you so much. You are so modest. Uh, it was not a small dose of influence. It was uh, 
quite a big dose of uh, a sense of direction for a new president. So I want to thank you for your invitation. And I want to commend the CGD, which continues to occupy the center point of all the issues uh, at the frontier of development. And I'm not surprised this uh, statistics is now the center of what you do. Uh, because not simply about donors and governments, the people now actually who want data now and yesterday are business people. People are deciding when they're allocating capital, who are deciding where to put their money. They're looking at data in terms of uh, reliability, volatility, the compatibility, that kind of stuff. And so I do think we have got a third partner in the triangle uh, who would be quite a major partner and you have to address that. I've entitled my discussion here, as you can see there, there's a young Maasai looking after his cow and he has got his uh, mobile phone. In fact, he's checking on the price of milk because uh, in the past, that Maasai would be depending upon middlemen to report on the price of milk. Now he, where he's in the bush, he can check the price of milk in the city and so he does uh, decisions about selling uh, to who. Now next, you have a young lady there. I suspect she's uh, helping some coffee dealer to try to figure out what the coffee price is uh, for the week. And both of them are relying very much on the dead one number, which could make a difference for their livelihood. Now, I was in London uh, two days ago, and this is how I began my, my talk, quoting Mayor Bloomberg. Mayor Bloomberg said, uh, that's what he said. <laughs> now, don't ask me whether it's true, but he's, he's reputed to have said that. And I, I kept saying to myself, uh, I'm not sure about the first one, but I agree with the second part. <laughs> The second one, which I used, was this one. So I'm see technological challenged. For those of you who speak French, the message is very clear. But for those of you who don't, this is a young man listening to radio, Africa is rising, GDP growing at 11%, all these fantastic numbers. And frankly, his own over responding is, what is it? I can't eat that number. Now, you may say, well, give him all kind of technical explanations, sophisticated explanations about uh, how you measure GDP income levels, but the chances are he represents millions of Africans who are asking deep questions about the meaning of the data we are generating. Not whether they're accurate or reliable, but what do they mean for them? So I think we need to find an answer for both uh, Mayor Bloomberg and this uh, Senegalese uh, taxi driver who is not alone. And especially when we come to some of these numbers which are continental in nature, Africa is growing at 10%. Average inflation is at X percent. All these big numbers. You know, Steve there and uh, Susanna are experts giving those numbers. Now, take a look at this next uh, uh, you recall the, con the controversy a couple of years back, two or three years ago, uh, about these African numbers, the lies, dumb lies in GDP. Huh? <laughs> Africa's poor numbers, uh, how we are cheated by uh, African statistics. And I do believe that I recall watching or rather listening to the debate between our chief economist and his people and those guys who are saying all these things. I thought actually they were talking at each other, not talking to each other. Because our people are saying, wait a minute. No, 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 our numbers are fine. Look at how we did them. Look at the methodology. But these people also had a point. And the reason is not difficult to find. Here it is. Each time we talk about Africa, it's not simply that we are 54 countries. So the 54 countries are so different. So when you have one big number attempt to summarize a complex reality, 
it becomes that even more complex and that meaningless. Just take a look here. That island, I suppose it's in Mindelo and Cap Verde, I don't know, I hope I'm right. That could be in the middle of the Central African Republic. That might be maybe in Southern Nigeria, middle of Johannesburg. So when you say uh, the average life in Africa is 50, what does it mean for the person there? When you say, in fact, the cutoff point for poverty is $2 a day, depends where you are. If it is $2 a day, you are in a small town in upcountry Uganda, family of five. That means uh, maybe $10 per day. That may be okay. But if you are in the middle of uh, Islam, in the middle of Johannesburg, the chances are their number for you is meaningless. So it is not about the number and its reliability alone. It's about how we interpret them depending upon what is it that we're saying. I suspect that we need to address both of those issues together. Now, these matters of whether statistics are right or wrong, uh, it depends, frankly. If you ask our guys, they'll tell you over the last 10 years, there have been huge amounts of improvement all around, civil registries, national income accounts, balance of payments, whatever it is. Now, we have spent ourselves about $100 million to try to build capacities uh, to improve the numbers, and um, our staff here can explain to you what we have done. Including dealing with this uh, issue, which I think Amanda will handle, about African civil registries, the missing people who are born and they die, and they leave no trace uh, on planet Earth. We have spent a lot of money there as well. Equally, to try and uh, bring some sanity to some of these issues, this is what the bank has been doing. But before I go there, there's another picture of uh, Africa for you. Actually, I don't know whose copyright is it. It says The Economist. But I've seen many people present this number. Uh, things in say The Economist. But all it says is simple. That Africa is not such a place as you think commonly. It's a huge place. Just imagine that we contain the United States, India, Western Europe, Mexico, and China, and all of them. I think only Australia does not fit into here. So it means each time you say Africa is growing by 11%, step back and say, but wait, wait a minute, what am I saying? And then you can then have some disaggregation, which answers to the concerns of different uh, people. So that is your registry. Those are the challenges which you know very well. I think uh, this report we're launching today uh, indicates all these issues. But I want to stop briefly just on the, on the last one. Because inadequate uh, institutions, we can handle them. It takes time. Poor infrastructure takes time. Lack of trained personnel, etc. But funding. I think uh, a man and I were chatting about just now. Is that whoever pays, what is it in English? Whoever pays the, the piper calls the tune. Okay. So if donors fund it, there are some things which they're more interested in. If business people are the ones looking for numbers, there are some things they're interested in, high-frequency data, for them to make a decision. But if it is donors, the chances are they'll be looking for this very complex number called, we're looking for results. They want to know what their money is buying. And so the chances are you'll have a lot of efforts concentrating the fire on the things donors want because they have to convince their parliament, they have to convince their partners in government to continue funding uh, ODA programs. And so I've got skewed programs in the country depending upon what donors want. I am a firm believer that the day uh, many of these things are funded by local resources, they'll be able to address the kind of numbers we want, the kind of numbers business people are looking for. So it's about, yes, of course, we can work together to get better numbers, but there have to be ownership of the funding and of the numbers. Now, here is the whole list of things the uh, African countries have been doing, if they're not familiar to some of you. Uh, a lot of work, 
at institutional level, at uh, organization level. And uh, the guy there in between, I think uh, Mark, you must know him, is a chief statistician of uh, South Africa, one of the uh, most famous people in this domain. A lot of work has been done, uh, including by the African Development Bank. That is, again, a bit of PR for, for the work I've done, including, by the way, supporting the censuses, census. Uh, even places like Angola, which had not done a census for 40 years, now it has been uh, completed. So people will tell you that African statistics are weak. Yes, it is true. But those who tell you that they are in shambles, that is true, another exaggeration. A lot of work has been done. There are still a lot of holes. But if you look carefully what you're looking for, the chances are you'll get it and you find some degree of uh, compatibility. Now, let me come to this issue of uh, rebasing, which has caused a lot of uh, uh, controversy. So here is Ghana, they rebase their numbers, and GDP goes up by 40%. Then Nigeria becomes the biggest economy in Africa. And then you have uh, now Kenya, I think it went up by uh, maybe 25%. True, the chances are if every country in Africa did that, that would be the story. But that's not an indication of weakness in statistics. It's the fact that they should be doing it much more regularly, five years generally, especially because the sector expanding so fast in Africa now is the services sector. In the case of Nigeria, what expanded enormously for them were the services, including the film industry which is now worth, if my numbers are right, uh, just under $400 million per year. So that integrate all those things uh, in the GDP, and not surprise, it went up, same as Kenya. So as we increasingly do rebasing on time, with the frequency which is done less well, you find that these things become less and less important. But I don't buy the argument that somehow this is an indication that African data is uh, catastrophic. There was this debate between this gentleman called, uh, I've forgotten his name, I need to check. Uh, uh, he's not Canadian University. Maybe you remember him, uh, Martin. He was making very important points. But along the way, I think he lost his own argument. It was a shame because he was making a very powerful point. Uh, because it is one thing to have wrong statistics or inadequate statistics, but it's something else to have statistics that can be manipulated. Because then, for business people, it becomes something quite serious in terms of their capital location. So I think that we are likely uh, not having numbers which can be manipulated by politicians. They do in the Western world sometimes, on uh, employment especially, especially close to an election. But I think that in the African case, it is mainly that we're catching up with the modern of doing things as we build capacities in the statistical offices. I think they are getting more autonomous, more independent, more capacities. And the more that happens, you find that our numbers are comparable to what you have elsewhere. So this is why I really want to load what Amanda and your team have done, what the center is doing. We want to support you, we want to cooperate with you to ensure that uh, we have got a thermometer uh, which works. Now, that is the way forward which you're proposing. I totally agree. I have nothing to disagree with this, except that I would like to add that the new relationship uh, is between the government, donors, and especially business business, both local and international. Just to give you an idea of how important this is, uh, I was once in a country which is one of the few attracting Chinese manufacturers, uh, one of the few which is succeeding. So we talked about the constraints to, to, uh, to attract investment, talk about logistics, clusters, the kind of things. Then he asked me, but uh, President, uh, where do you think this currency is going. There's another risk for us. 
Well, I couldn't do the numbers for him where I think they, uh, they were going, but looking at the monetary survey, the kind of stuff. But he said, wait a minute, no, but uh, I'm also looking at the uh, exports of that product, the imports of this, I've checked on government expenditures. So you could see the doubts about where they are going. And that was holding back their investment at this for the particular quarter. So Amanda, I want to suggest that we add a third partner here, which is business. And begin with the very small business people, those who are in the informal sector, close the informal sector, and they move up. Those are the people who need very high frequency data. Now, that might mean that instead of waiting for the big census, for the big uh, bang, we focus on much more frequent small surveys. Uh, they may give you imperfect numbers, but the chances are if you do much more frequently, sector by sector, you'll accumulate a set of information which uh, all the partners here and the third partners will be uh, finding useful. So let me uh, conclude. Now, I want to go back to Mayor Bloomberg. <laughs> now, not because I want to challenge the first part, as I said, I want to say that in Africa rising we trust, because we believe this continent is going places. Today, if you look at the papers in, uh, in Washington, it's about Ebola. It's about Ebola wipe, wiping off 35 billion dollars of Africa's economies. I want to use the opportunity I have here to say I don't believe for once those figures, since we're talking about statistics. It's a doomsday scenario. In a paper interview I was doing just now, I think it's a nuclear option scenario. It really assumes that we don't know what to do. We're not willing to do what it takes to contain Ebola in the three countries where it's the epicenter. At the rate at which it is going, <coughs> because of the delay in uh, responding to Ebola, uh, we still think two and a half, three percent of GDP, that are the numbers we're looking at. But the idea that this thing is going to spread from this epicenter to the whole of West Africa, including Africa's largest economy, I don't agree. Proof number one, this Ebola patient arrived in Lagos, it was contained, because Nigerian systems are working. Another patient arrived in Senegal, it was contained. But the three countries, the, in the Mano River, after a decade and a half of civil war, they have no systems. The example I gave in the morning at the conference was a one about Haiti and Chile, which you know very well. So in 2010, you have got a network in Chile, 8.8 .8 on the Richter scale, kills less than 500 people. The one in Haiti, seven, I think, if I recall, kills a quarter of a million people, almost. 1.2 million displaced, simply because systems are not the same. To make matters worse, Ebola is first reported in February 2014. But because it is treated as a remote a health, public health issue in a remote part of Africa, the measures are not taken on time. So it takes five months. So five months later, we're now all running behind the curve to try to contain this problem. Now, my deep feeling is that we can contain it if we do the right things. The world has the means to contain it. We have the knowledge, we have the means. It's not easy but it can be done. And if it is done in the next few months, we can contain the damage 2.5-3% of GDP. But the idea that this is a catastrophe for West Africa, for Africa, at the limit is so irresponsible. Because it means that we know what to do and we're not willing to do it. Or that we don't have the means to deal with that epidemic in the three countries of West Africa. So here you are again on your numbers. Why Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, one of the weakest parts of Africa in terms of those kind of systems. So people are guessing. Me, I'd rather pull back and work with them maybe every week to look at the numbers which are coming from the markets, from small businesses, and you construct a much more complete picture. 
instead of sitting in the office doing some of these long-term scenarios, some of which are frankly meaningless. So I want to stop there by saying that look at statistics not as a technical issue. It's an issue which is also meaningful for the welfare of the people, even for their lives, and also in terms of guiding policies. So for that reason alone, I'm prepared to agree with Mayor Bloomberg that uh, we trust in uh, the Almighty, but everyone else, including those now giving these very stupid projections in the West African region, bring up me the data. We want to see the data on which you are basing to make this judgment. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kabaruka. That was an incredible demonstration of why better data matters for almost anything, down to one's individual well-being, to investment, and to our own health and, and the future. So in a moment, I'll be joined on stage with very distinguished discussants. Two people. First, uh, Dr. Haishan Fu, who's the head of development economics data at the World Bank and Mark Sussman, who's the president of Global Policy, Advocacy, and Country Programs at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. But before we turn to them, I'm pleased to have a few brief remarks from my co-chair from the African Population Health and Research Center. His name is Alex Aze. He's based in Nairobi. We're going to show it on this screen, so I don't know if you want to sit here while we show it. We'll just be five short minutes, and then we'll be back up. Alex was the co-chair and co-author of the final report. Um, we're sorry that he can't be in person with us today, but I think that he'll introduce what this working group was all about and what it meant for our group. So go ahead. Good afternoon and greetings from Nairobi. Uh, my name is Alex Eze, and I am the executive director of the African Population and Health Research Center and one of the co-conveners of the Data for African Development Working Group that generated the report for this dissemination. I'm sorry I'm not able to be with you in person today. It's a long way from Nairobi, but I'm pleased to be able to send these uh, few remarks. This working group brought together key national, regional, and international stakeholders and partners to address some of the key challenges that affect data systems and data generation and use in Africa. We identified those strategies and offered key recommendations that we believe are implementable and achievable. These recommendations underscore the importance and need for country leadership and ownership of such a revolution, and the need for, for national statistical offices to have levels of autonomy and independence with guaranteed local or domestic funding that can support their operations. We also identified key roles that development partners would need to play to support such country-led efforts. We believe that country ownership and leadership, starting with a clear strategy for the autonomy and independence of national statistical offices with guaranteed local or domestic funding for their operations, is central to achieving a sustainable data revolution in Africa. We did identify key opportunities for different stakeholders to support such country level efforts in driving that revolution. Through your deliberations today, we hope that you will identify specific strategies and efforts that are needed to implement not just the, the, the working group's recommendations, but a true country led effort in achieving data revolution in Africa. Thank you and have a fruitful deliberation. Thank you, Alex. Statisticians of the world unite. OK, so I'd like to invite up our uh, panelists back onto the stage, Dr. Kabaruka, Drs. Fu and Sussman. So you know that both the World Bank and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as the African Development Bank, have been really leaders on data. They've been main investors in data. And we hope that all of them will play a role in developing and driving the data revolution forward for business, for regular people, and for policymakers. So one of the key recommendations from our report, which both Alex and President Kabaruka mentioned, is more country ownership. But here, the, the funders play an enormous role. In our study, we found that in some cases, up to 80% of the budget of a national statistics office was covered by external funders. So donors have a really big role to play in delivering a data revolution. 
So I wanted to open it up to you first and ask you about your views on the challenges and opportunities that are posed both by Dr. Kabaruka and by the idea of the data revolution in general. So shall we start with Mark and then we'll go towards, yeah. I'll join Great. you. Great, well thank you uh, Amanda and thanks to CGD for organizing this event and thanks also to Donald for uh, always provocative and, and sort of stimulating opening uh, speech because there are few issues that are more important at the moment in terms of driving development progress than properly understanding our data. That the opening slide that Donald has um, that said in you if we can't measure it it's just not going to be done and that's very true and that's something that's certainly at the heart of how the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has approached our work really from our inception um, as a foundation and that's partly because our co-chairs Bill and Melinda Gates are very, very strong believers in the power of data to guide accurate investments or accurate high impact investments that are going to um, maximize results in the areas that we have chosen to work in, which are primarily healthcare, financial services, agricultural development. And one of the striking things as we have moved into these fields, and remember we're still a relatively new entity, we're just uh, not, not even 15 years old yet, uh, was how uneven the data was and exactly some of the challenges that uh, are highlighted both in the CGD report and in Donald's comments about the need to rebase and, and focus on data and this is something that Haishan and others have, have lived with over many years and it led us in a position where we caught we would love and I think in fact probably assumed when we came in to the foundation that we would be able to rely, rely on data as a kind of global national public good that we could then help shape and use it. And then finding those gaps in the data against these key issues, including you know, very simple, uh, critically important issues like just tracking vaccination rates uh, and then child or maternal mortality rates or things that are, are framed in, in the MDGs were, was very challenging. And so we are now in a position where we do fund enormous amounts. I, I think we have over 150 different grants uh, active grants working on different types of data worth over $750 million. And that is a big investment. It is also, uh, you know, it's hopefully part of the solution, but frankly, we're also part of the problem mm -hmm. in that because we're using our grants in many cases to plug gaps, often in an ad hoc way, often in a select subset of geographies against particular needs or issues. Uh, that aren't necessarily leaving behind that kind of broader infrastructure for development that we're talking about that is so necessary. So I think one of the challenges we have and what we're trying to work on is what are the ways we can better align that because we don't want to stop making the investments. They're critical to help guide our work. But are there ways to combine that and combine it with the work of the World Bank and the African Development Bank and sort of other funders uh, to do that in a much more effective way that leaves a bigger legacy? And I think that um, my closing thought is that uh, with the discussion that's been generated by uh, the debate over the post-2015 um, development agenda, which itself, the reason why it is such a lively debate is because what has been measured in the MDGs has mattered and has driven real progress, and so there's a real focus on what comes next and an understanding that we do need what's often thrown around as a data revolution to help underpin the next phase of that and knowing that we don't yet have the ingredients and the core bits in place to do that. So that's why I think both the report and Donald's challenge to us is such a critically important uh, challenge to all of us as a community to really get this right. Okay, thanks a lot, Mark. Taishan, with apologies, Dr. Kabaruka has to attend a meeting on the Arab Spring, which I think we would all agree. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think data is really important. <laughs> but anyhow, would you want to say any final words before you have to go and then we'll turn back to Haishan? Sure. Uh, thank you, Matt. I want to apologize. Uh, I would love, love to stay with you, but uh, if you see, uh, believe in the Arab Spring, uh, we still have to understand what's going on up there, so we'll have to go to... Mm -hmm. I just wanted to, to give you a thought that uh, uh, the young Senegalese driver uh, is not challenging statistics, but it's challenging the, the lecture we make of the statistics themselves. And I want to urge you as you look for even better statistics, we need to have a dialogue with the people who consume those statistics so that they understand what it means. Uh, I gave a lecture in Addis. Uh, and I said that Ethiopia had uh, 
cut by half poverty in 20 years, between 1995 and uh, about now, from 60% to 30%. So Ethiopia, which used to be a poster child of starvation, famine, all the problems on planet Earth, now has been able to dramatically uh, cut uh, poverty. Believe me, they didn't believe me at all. I could have been talking to Mars. Because the issue is, okay, but what is it for me? Mm -hmm. So that debate you need to have. Maybe not statisticians, but uh, those of you who work in the numbers must know there are a lot of cynicism down there mm. about some of these uh, big data. That's why we had this debate about who is the middle class. So Susanna there, uh, she's uh, one of our leading economists, they had uh, issued a report about uh, the African middle class growing and to generate a huge amount of controversy. I'm sure you can share some of it mm -hmm. today. So I hope that you can also uh, advance towards that terrain. But thank you for what you are doing. I thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry I have to go. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kaburuka. Go ahead, Haishan. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda. What a pleasure to join you all, especially to join Mark. Uh, and thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, congratulations, Amanda, for this excellent piece of uh, report. Uh, what a great analysis of the political economy of, uh, of development data. Uh, I think you have really drawn attention to these persistent challenges we're facing. And it's, it's, it's a great timing to put this forward in this discussion of data revolution, what it meant. I think what it meant is that whatever we're going to pursue through this data revolution have to be some transformative changes will break away from the patterns you described in this report. And here I just want to highlight three issues. One is I think this data revolution we're pursuing will have to have a mindset shift. Mindset shift doesn't mean that we'll shift away from the basic business we have to do so well. But at the same time, we also need to innovate to go beyond the basics. So let me just clarify a few points. One is that, as um, Dr. Cabarula mentioned at the end, what we're talking about, developing uh, data that we really need, is not just a technical issue. But for so long, we have been really treating it as a secondary issue in our development agenda. It's always about MMEs, about tagging along, about supporting the bigger development. But I think we have to change our mindset to look at the development issue as a development agenda in its own right. That means it's about whether public institutions, the government statistical system, have the capacity to produce the right data. And it's also about fostering this sector of development will pr produce the data which are the soft infrastructure for development, as how ICT has taken on its own meaning in, in becoming a driver for development. So we really have to have that mind shift. That means not only we need to understand the political economy mm -hmm. of data, but also the economics of data. We really need to start beginning to see how to really bring the value of data into our economic accounting. Here, we would rely on all of you from the development economics uh, uh, community to really start to build this concept in order to really shift and anchor how we, in, in the future, to invest in this uh, development uh, uh, data business. Um, and um, so this also means for development partners such as the World Bank, we would need to really engage with countries from this angle to integrate integrate investment in statistics um, uh, as a development program with countries. So to, to motivate countries to invest themselves as a foundation for domestic funding for the developing data, but also to help countries in this transition towards more sustainable domestic uh, funding. So I think this is really important. But second, I, we all know that when we're talking about this data revolution with all the possibilities offered by technology, digital revolution, the internet of things, we know in the near future, the development data community is not going to be just a national government system, but rather a private-public partnership, you know, with a lot of new players and new kind of data coming into play. But it doesn't mean we'll do away with the government statistical system, which was still the core of this future system. That means we'll have to really understand the core business. You called it um, building, block. building blocks, the statistics, and what will drive us to, to get there. So this is about coming back to some of the basics, to really build improved administrative data system to really invest in 
you know, uh, doing the household surveys or census much better, leveraging the new technology, and also coordinate the effort in doing this so that it will be embedded in the statistical system itself rather than the donors extracting information from countries. So this is really, really important. I I'm glad the World Bank, after I joined, I see that how we're getting up our effort to support the improvement of CR, uh, civil registration vital statistics and looking at how to improve household surveys as part of the government data system itself, but also look into innovations and see how you know, we can leverage this new um, uh, uh, method and new data sources, new technology and innovate. The third point is about we need to take care of our fundamental business, but we also have to evolve uh, with, with, with this uh, process. And we really need to invest in innovation so that we can go beyond and to meet the, the broader data requirement now. You know, this whole post-2015 development agenda is, is calling upon us to do. And that means not only innovate in the kind of technology will enable not only the government system to do our business better, but also to see how we can incentivize the private sector to join this development data business to leverage what they can help to generate and in order to help us to understand um, the sustainable development better. It's also about uh, uh, innovation in our institutional arrangement. Uh, you mentioned mm -hmm. um, you know, how we should have a new compact and how we should look at the NSDS with a new light because it's not just about replicating the more developed system as we know so far, but looking into what would be the new element of the relationship between mm -hmm. different kind of data producers and users and, 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 uh, and build in this space for innovation in order for us to move forward. Lastly, I think coming together, the government side and private side, we really need new rules of the game in order to understand better how we manage, look into the potential, but also manage the risk, including in terms of privacy and data sharing and open data, so on and so forth, so that we have basic rule of the game in order for us to engage with each other. Mm -hmm. So let okay. me just stop here for now. Thank you, Haishan. So in our report, uh, we also drew on some statistics from Paris 21 that suggest that about 2% of official development assistance is going for data. Of course, you've also mentioned a pretty significant amount that the foundation has been investing annually. It, when you think forward, how could you imagine the foundation engaging differently in this space? Well, I'll, let me answer that in two ways. I mean, one, my wish list, which isn't going to happen, is that we wouldn't really have to invest in data at all because it would be seen as such a clear public good yeah. that you know both regular donor community and national statistical offices would be fully funded and able to do this because mm -hmm. it's kind of the indispensable thread to which you do. In practice, I think you know it's going to look a little different sector by sector, country by country, but hopefully with some more con uh, common underpinnings. And I think there are two elements that we need to look at. One is which data is actually most useful to drive applied policy change? So I can say that they, on the researcher side, and apologies to you who are, you know, there's, research for its own sake isn't going to help Donald's taxi driver. Mm -hmm. You know, th there is, there's lots of fascinating data out there which would be great to know and help it, but probably isn't going to help move the needle on whether a government should undertake a slightly different allocation of its health sector spending to put more into this kind of commodity procurement for primary health, whatever it might be. And so I think doing a sort of harder look of linking the statistical collection, a lot of which, and this is less my field than both your fields, but a lot of what we do is driven by inertia of we've captured these kinds of data before mm -hmm. and the ways in which we do it. And I think there is an opportunity to just take it up and look at, can we collect slightly less data in some key ways, but make sure that data is more accurate and the more accurate against what we hope is going to help shift policy. And that probably is a way to make it more attractive because the other challenge is, uh, while I think almost everyone agrees with the state statement that, of course, we should fund it better, mm -hmm. there's some real sticker shock attached to it. I mean, often doing yeah. it well can be a little expensive. And we do think there are more innovative ways to collect you know, mm -hmm. real-time uh, data and from surveillance systems up to national statistical ones. But I think it's going to be finding and identifying some almost uh, case studies that show how this can work more effectively, ideally in key sectoral areas that are underpinned by global consensus that we do want to go, so some, some version of what's going to be in the post-2015 development goals. 
and then see if we can do a better job at aligning, as attempts like Paris 21 and others are trying to do, pool that spending, make sure that the multilateral organizations, which are um, both empowered and accountable for some form of statistics, whether it's you know, the FAO on agricultural ones or WHO on key health ones and mm -hmm. the bank on economic and financial ones, you know, are able to do that public good. But it's, unfortunately, there's no easy answer to it. Yeah. Let me ask you something, Haishan. You've raised the issue of the, of the sustainable development goals. We now have, I think it's about 119 goals, right? So that has an enormous data cost associated yeah. with it. And I guess there's going to be, Haishan is a member of the independent advisory expert group on the data revolution that was convened by the UN Secretary General. So I wanted to ask you what, what to recommend to countries like the ones that the working group was looking at, where some of the basics still need to get done at better quality or with greater timeliness or with greater openness. How, how to balance that basics emphasis with this new set of global goals? Um, I, I think this is an exact, exciting time, not because we know all the answers, precisely because <laughs> there's so many questions still need to be answered. So there, therefore, that it's really exciting because if we can dare to look forward and, and, and set our priorities right. As I said earlier, there's, this is about meeting this broader uh, goals, but uh, trying to pursue a so-called data revolution is not just about monitoring the SDGs itself. It's really about whether we can really build the capacity in different countries across the world to really get the kind of information or enhance our ability to, to understand and manage you know, the development issues. So I think we have to get the basics right. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I really support your report to look mm -hmm. into, you know, get a, our common understanding of, about what is the core business in the national statistics system. We really need to help them to do it right. And whether we can mobilize domestic resources, while at the same time to support those that needed it most to have this international development uh, uh, support and, and gradually help them to move forward. At the same time, we would indeed look into this other possibilities of, of meeting some of those data needs by engaging with the new players, new data sources, and experiment with them. We don't know enough of how to leverage those so-called big data for social good, uh, social good yet. Mm -hmm. Therefore, innovation and experiment will be very important. In this context, I think donors need to support it, but with the mentality that we might fail along the way, every now and then, but we need to give us the chance in order to find a better approach to, towards it. So I think, you know, I agree with, uh, with Mark, what he commented. At the same time, we also need to realize it's not just about more resources. There are a lot of resources not being efficiently used. Mm. And therefore, we also need to look at issue of how we can not only understand where to place the priorities, but also how we really coordinate with each other. Once for all, now, we can go beyond our institutional confines than to look at how we can better coordinate with each other. For example, we have DHS, we have MIX, we have also LSMS. I have to thank Gates Foundation for supporting bank in pursuing that, that in that? many countries. That, that is amazing, right? <laughs> and the, uh, yeah. and mm -hmm. I'm so glad now there's this mm -hmm. will to come together to look at how we can, to the extent possible, to harmonize not only the, 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 the content, but also in terms of timing, uh, in, in a, cro a cross-walking way to align the, 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 how country could make use of this support mm -hmm. to uh, carry out the surveys in a way that you know, we will avoid duplication, but to strengthen the result that we can get from those surveys. So there's also a lot of efficient use of the resources. Excellent. Well, that's music to our ears. We have to wrap up? No, we have to go to the audience. OK, <laughs> excellent. So now I'd like to ask you to, um, we can take about three questions, let's say, from the audience. And then we'll have our panelists respond. Sorry. our working group, so I'm going to give him the first right of commentary, and then we'll go to you. Go ahead. And maybe introduce yourself and say where you're from, please. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Dozier, and I'm here just to show that uh, Amanda and Alex did not make up the list of members of the working group. There's yeah. actually somebody yeah. who was in the working group, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> I work for the Economic Commission for Africa, and I'm the chief of the data technology section and also the officer in charge of the center. 
It's not really a question, but just to, a comment to add. They've, they've said most of the things that need to be said, but one of the things that we think about is this reporting burden that we hear about every time. That the reason that there is a reporting burden on, our, on data is that we, all of us, seem to emphasize data that will report what has been done rather than emphasizing what data has been used in doing what is being done. And one of the things we'd like to see in the post-2015 agenda is to one metric that we measure. If you tell me your educational system has gone this far, show me what data you used to achieve, not data you used to measure, but data you used to achieve it, which would then lead to an endogamous need for the data, so that they will know that there's need for data to be collected, not just when you need to report. Because that way, they think they're doing you a favor, giving you the data you want. But if you make them know that they have to use data to achieve those things they achieve, then they will see the need for that data, and therefore there's an incentive to keep it up to date and to keep it collected. That's my comment. But then I need to beg the organizer to make an announcement that uh, the Conference of Ministers of the Economic Commission for Africa and the heads of state separately passed a resolution asking ECA to work with the ADB and the African Union to organize a high-level conference on data revolution in 2014, but because 2014 is almost finishing, we're likely to organize it in the middle of January, and through Amanda, we'll try to reach out to all of you for that. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Josie. I think that's great news. Go ahead to the first row here. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Steve Kaizim Geru. I'm the uh, acting chief economist of the ADB. Um, I'm happy that you. my boss is not here, so I can make a few disparaging comments. <laughs> I'm an old uh, <laughs> professor, so when I heard him talk about research for research, research, research's sake, I didn't, I mean, this is a kind of criticism here all the time. All research is irrelevant. But one thing why your report is making a lot of sense is because you have credibility, mm. and credibility that is lying behind the kind of research you did. Uh, and one thing I don't see a whole lot of happening is that we are not involving universities in Africa. We are doing a whole lot of things. There isn't a whole lot of, in fact, this debate about statistics that you see is mainly a Western-driven Canada here, of course, and so on. Mm. I do believe that until it is actually done, when Africans feel that they are doing research and they're presenting it out and it's creating prestige for them as institutions in the various places, Akari University, Nairobi University, and so on, very likely, like, the African Economic Research Consortium. Mm -hmm. It's a very prestigious, there's reports that everybody listens. I think until we do that, it probably will not have so much impact. So I would really would like, uh, since you have zillions of money to, out there, to provide some of it. It's not always very easy, but I think it can be done. And that's one way of really getting to the basics. Of, so research, of course, has to be relevant, involve uh, different universities, maybe in uh, kind of collaborative arrangement, maybe training between American institutions and, you know, and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think Thank that you. makes a lot of sense. I mean, this issue of data users and constituents, whether they're business, whether they're universities or think tanks, that's, that's the solution here, probably at base. We have time for one more comment, and then we'll ask our panelists to respond. Nisha is another person on our working groups. I, I hate to do that. That's so wrong. But I think you should say something. Misha Belkindis from Open Data Watch. That way you don't have to introduce yourself. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I obviously cannot criticize the report. And the you can. I just, it's OK. <laughs> no, it's a great report. But uh, let me make just uh, two comments. Uh, one is uh, you know, we are being involved in this uh, uh, hosting exercise for probably every 10 years. Mm -hmm. We've done in 2004 for Marrakesh, and now we see publications, and some of them are very scary, and they're scared. But I would say that uh, the donors and the country shouldn't be scared uh, of, of what has to be put in. Uh, the issue is uh, that, you know, you just mentioned that we have 169 goals. Uh, you don't have to have 169 surveys to trace this 169 goals. You have to have a well-working statistical system who produces data, and then you tweak and you get uh, the indicator which, which you need. So that's, I want to make one comment, and I think that the data revolution, the train, is 
out and you know nobody will stop it so so basically we need to gear up and do it and the second point i want to make is uh, about uh, data openness i think the more we open the data uh, the less we have problems for policy makers and for financiers and for everybody because we know really what we have mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately um, professor dr kabruka uh, left but uh, you know he showed us the open data for Africa. And it's a great uh, achievement done by the African Development Bank. However, it's not open data for Africa. It's an open space to yeah. put data for Africa. It's, it's not open data there. So, so we have a lot of work to do, particularly in Africa, in any other countries. Uh, and that will, will, will give us results, and that will uh, contribute to the data revolution. And obviously, that will, uh, uh, will not scare people that we don't have data. Yes, don't be afraid of the data revolution. Can I turn to you then, Mark and Haishan, for some last uh, comments, and then we'll wrap up with uh, responses to the comments? Sure, well, let me be uh, first just on the sort of comment of, of uh, sort of data for its own sake or research. I want to be sort of careful that it's sort of, you know, it, we have actually been a significant supporter of the um, AERC historically, and a lot of that kind of work. But I do want to draw a distinction between a kind of data which I agree is universities, think tanks, there are many institutions and places that are homes of statisticians and others which are important generators of data and we want to elevate the importance of that. Uh, but again, it is true is we do need at a national level and a global level common, reliable, focused statistics around key indicators to help drive informed policy decisions at its simplest. So, you know, if you don't have, let me use an example of Ethiopia because it came up and Ethiopia did a, a great response. So if you, you know, we had a real discrepancy in supposed vaccination rates a couple of years ago between, you know, a delta of around 30% between, you know, the national survey data and the global survey data. Now, 30%, the difference is where are you distributing? How many do you procure? Which parts of the country should they be sent to? Uh, unless you have a better objective that you will end up misallocating vast amounts of resources that are already going to be allocated there. And you can use that. Now, in that case, the government was very forthright, commissioned its own additional study. We got a lot more accurate data, and we're now doing that. And you can see that in, in some of the great reductions in uh, child mortality rates and improvements of vaccination that Ethiopia is, is enjoying. But unless you were able to do that, and even doing that is a quite political and tricky decision. You know, the Ethiopia, governments have an incentive to believe the good numbers, or you know, your report actually talks about some of the you know, challenging incentives that some of the uh, global uh, initiatives in areas like vaccination can impose. And so what you need to do is have a balance on that, but ultimately it's all towards that final common good. And on the uh, 167 targets and, and indicators, what um, you know, it's been being described in some quarters as kind of no target left behind, is <laughs> uh, uses a, a, a significant number of those when you read through them are simply unmeasurable. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, there's going to be a, a, a fairly natural reduction <laughs> into what can be. And what we'd like to just focus on is can you get at least a hard group? Then, again, we have biases that we think they should be in the areas like healthcare, like nutrition, like sanitation, um, where like access to family planning, uh, and obviously the broader economic uh, hunger and, and poverty indicators where that's the bedrock we need mm -hmm. to get right. Yeah. And then there's a whole lot of nice to have enhancements around that. But if we can all collectively focus on those improvements, that would be an enormous public good for everybody. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you. No, I, I can't agree more with, with Mark, but I just want to support the comment made by Misha on the open data, the need for open data, but also I think we also need more open data watchdogs. Um, but I just want to, um, throughout this, um, because the, you mentioned the whole issue about the financing, and I'm glad to say tomorrow, actually, at the, the bank's annual meetings, mm -hmm. there will be an event on financing for development. And what we are really trying to push is that there has to be a piece on financing for development data in how we are moving forward, uh, looking at, at the, how to support the, the 
sustainable development agenda uh, bring the realism to it. Um, and uh, in this regard, I'm glad to say that the bank is working very closely with you, with uh, Gates Foundation, with all the other uh, uh, multilateral development banks and UN site um, to look into uh, how we really um, prioritize what would be the, uh, the new innovative ways of mobilizing uh, international uh, support for statistic development in countries. So I Excellent. hope that we will follow through and there will be this uh, um, financial development uh, conference uh, in July. We hope by then there could be some concrete ideas. Yeah, I, I think a great suggestion that you made is that data in itself is a good, although obviously it's only as good as its use. Um, by the dif different people are going to translate that into value. But as a, as a governance indicator on its own, it's quite important. So thanks to all of you for spending an hour with us during one of the most busy weeks in Washington. Thank you very much to Mark and Haishan for spending time. And we welcome you to tweet and take reports and keep in touch with us. Thank you. <laughs>